Namaste and welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savitri with our beloved Avarbhai. We continue in Book 4, The Book of Birth and Quest, Canto 2, The Growth of the Flame, and we are on page 365, just at the break by the bottom. So, as we are being revealed, different kinds of beings responding to Savitri, to the divinity in her, and we see this in earth, that uh, some open to the divine, some respond with resistance, some are even afraid of the divine presence. And uh, I was reading, you know, what Mother has spoken about it. She says, mm -hmm. some revolt yes. and are afraid. Why? Because the divine presence means they have to change. So, <laughs> you know, everybody likes to live within their limits. So, all are not ready for accepting and acknowledging the divine in life. That's why you see certain philosophies where divine is not there, find an easy acceptance in human beings. And one reason is because there is no pressure to change. So that's what I was uh, just sharing in mm. the previous class that while uh, strange, I am talking of India about uh, universities in India, that Freudian psychology is taught but not Vedantic psychology, mm. Mm. which is a strange paradox. Yes. I mean, you teach Freudian psychology, but you also teach Vedantic psychology. Because Vedantic psychology is a cry for change. It's an exploration into portions of being which are hidden. But Freudian psychology is very easy. Man is filth, he is mud, he is uh, an animal. So, it's very good. You don't need anything. <laughs> so, uh, we read, you know, all kinds of beings. But since in everybody there is some soul essence... So even when there is a revolt, there is still some kind of a drawing, a wonder and revolt. So that's what we read previously and now we read further. I've seen also in physical education. Yes. Your mother put such emphasis on it and so many people said, no, we want to do meditation. Yes. That's all. Yes. No, no care for the body, no concern for the body. There is another interesting thing that, uh, you know, it's it's known, well known in all spiritual paths that there is a difference between being physically near the master and being inwardly close to the divine. <laughs> it is a well known difference. There is a difference between being or living in an institution and practicing the path. There is a difference between the two. Yeah, and uh, you know all this, uh, there is a difference between talking about the path and walking the path. It's well known in all uh, circles, in all spiritual circles. So we have to be careful that we don't uh, take it for granted that just because we are uh, physically have an access to Samadhi and because you know we are fortunate to be able to come to Ashram and read the books and maybe even talk about it, it automatically translates into uh, inner nearness. It is something which one has to practice. That is the whole path of yoga. I would also like to say that uh, any of you who are in the educational system in India, we see that so many saints, yogis are honored. Very rarely we see Sri Aurobindo having a place oh, yes, in yes, universities. That, of course. Very rarely. Yes. And even when it is there, now they have some universities which have a seat on Sri Aurobindo. They reduce it into just, you know, PhD. Now, PhD is... Uh, Yoga is never learnt in a classroom like that. Yoga is something to be lived. It is always a one-to-one -one instruction. Yoga is like yes. that. It is yes. never a... But mid this world, these hearts that answered her call, none could stand up her equal and her mate. So there is also a difference between being a devotee and a disciple. Mother speaks of that. She says, as far as protection is concerned, you can have it anywhere. You can pray to divine and uh, the whole history of spiritual and religious evolution is witness to the fact that whenever man has sincerely sought the divine help, he has it. And there are people who have that kind of relation with the divine. But it's quite another to actually undertake the journey. So this answering to the call means that 
in vain she stooped to equal them with her heights too pure that air was for small souls to breathe so she is the one who comes close to us but even that man finds difficult because you know he finds even that like a pressure these comrade selves to raise to her own wide breaths her heart desired and fill with her own power so what the mother wants to give us is uh, a diviner life a diviner power a diviner force that a diviner force might enter life a breath of god had greaten human time but what we want from the divine is not the transforming force but the force that helps us to perpetuate perpetuate a life in ignorance and to continue to give us those very things which are going to enslave us further and further but what she wants to give is the divine force that can transform us <laughs> this is the difference although she leaned down to their littleness covering their lives with her strong passionate hands and knew by sympathy their needs and wants and dived in the shallow wave depths of their lives and met and shared their heartbeats of grief and joy and bent to heal their sorrow and their pride lavishing the might that was hers on her lone peak to lift to it their aspirations cry she leaned down there is a very interesting story you know so many stories so many people have experienced here uh, in fact someone told that you know because she came to us with so much of humanness that sometimes we couldn't take that step to see the divine behind the human so one of the story is um, when a child who was 7 his father asked the mother divine mother that i want to gift a cycle so mother said okay on on his birthday so from the mother or through the mother the cycle goes father has gifted five years pass suddenly on 12th birthday of the child the mother calls him and says i have something to give you i have given you a cycle five years back now you must have outgrown the cycle and i want to give you this new cycle which will fit into you now this was not told by the father <laughs> now look at the divine mother remembering and taking care of these small little things um, to what extent she could come of course the child is vijay bhai we all you know know and uh, father is navjha ji i mean how she could come to and countless stories uh, people recount but at the same time um, there is something we must remember that i'll just read and though she drew their souls into her vast and surrounded with the silence of her deeps and held as the great mother holds her own only her earthly surface bore their charge and mixed its fire with their mortality her greater self lived soul unclaimed within me so we should be very careful of you know uh, sometimes idolizing those who were very close to physically close i am sharing a very personal experience regarding this so when i had come so obviously i think like uh, almost all of us i was just looking for somebody who had darshan of shiv bindu for me it was like i would fall at the feet of the person and because you know you feel like that it's a psychic impulse that you would were not fortunate enough to have a darshan but somebody who had a darshan by default <laughs> you want to so mother's ways that very evening my wish was fulfilled i had mentioned it to someone and uh, i was in, in in staying in international guest house and a word came through you you remember you wanted to see somebody who had darshan of shirobindo there is someone i rushed leaving behind everything and this lady told me that can you leave me to my house i thought what better service can i ever do in life <laughs> so i started walking with her and i wanted to know you know what was the darshan of mother <laughs> shorbindo <laughs> so the moment i would uh, broach that subject she was so oblivious to it she said you know uh, i am uh, glad you are leaving me because you know now i have this problem that problem she told me everything from the problem of uh, gas cylinder and everything <laughs> except the darshan <laughs> 
<laughs> By the time I reached, I was like, Lord, <laughs> darshan has to be your own and has to be within. Uh, I mean, there are people who have beautifully grown, but still, even the best, the highest, we should not think that, you know, we should not allow anyone to come between our direct relation with the Divine Mother. And it's there in the Mother itself. They do not allow. And it's not necessary. Her earthly surface bore their charge. Even those who rose to great heights, it was just a little bit of her fire was enough to uplift them. But that's the divinity, the power of divinity. I want to go back a moment from your previous statement and I can share a personal experience with Mother. In, uh, in those days, she was seeing thousands of people a week. And I wrote a letter to her and she answered that letter by writing in between the spaces all answers to all my questions. Some weeks passed and she asked to see me again. And I went to her and exactly point by point that was in the letter, she expanded on all of those things. After seeing so many thousands of yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Unbelievable actually. I mean... I'm saying unbelievable from a human point of view, something which is seemingly impossible. Mm -hmm. And yet, that's how she has been. So many stories and uh, I've heard about how she would deal with each one. And she would remember. Absolutely. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Champak Lalji asked Mother, she had this, somebody had this prayer to mother. Mother, uh, may I never forget you. So Champak Lalji said, what kind of weird fellow this is. How can you forget mother and Shurabindu? <laughs> I can understand that mother and Shurabindu may forget you because you know, they are meeting thousands and thousands of people. It's understandable if they forget. How can you forget mother and Shurabindu? What kind of prayer is this? Then he writes, much later I understood that what he prayed for was right. Yes. Mother and Shurabindu never forget. She even says, someone whom she has seen even for a moment, yes. even those who have turned hostile and gone away, revolted and gone away, she holds herself responsible for them. This is the kind of love she brought. Yes. Oftener in dumb natures stir and peace, a nearness she could feel serenely won. The force in her drew earth's subhuman broods. There is an actual experience of mother in Paris hmm. when she was 15 and suddenly all the animals suddenly went, were drawn to her. And so many stories, some of them we have already shared of her communication with plants, with animals. Plants would tell her, now vegetables, now I am ready, now I am not ready. Yeah, pick the, me, pick me. Pick me, pick <laughs> me. The flowers would reveal their essence. The tree would come and tell her that, you know, the axe has been put into my uh, trunk. trunk. So, yes. uh, subhuman brutes. At one place she says the uh, animal and plant life will be the first to respond. And this now I am personally convinced, looking at all the dogs around the ashram, that, you know, animals will be the first to respond. Uh, human beings come much later and there is a reason she will tell she us. She actually wrote to me about the plants mm. and said they, their whole life is an aspiration for light. Yes. Mm. And they'll be amongst the first to respond. Yes, it's there in her conversation. Plants and animals will be among the first one. Shurabindu even goes on to say in conversations that uh, why do you think that human beings are superior and then he gives the example of all the creatures of a tigress. He says that there was a tigress who's, uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, was being taken from the zoo to another zoo or another in the wilds. And when the tigress was leaving, she had the trainer who was feeding and everything. The look on the tigress face of that love, that attachment, that uh, compassion. She said, seldom you find it in human beings. Yes. And she had it. And she said it is the presence of the psychic in the vital that has this kind of a love where, you know, you feel this kind of emotion. She says, human beings uh, 
turned too selfish and he is giving of all the creatures the example of a tigress which is fierce creature not of a dog or a cat and of course dog and cat he has given so many examples the force in her drew earth's subhuman broods and to her spirit's large and free delight she joined the ardent youd magnificent lives of animal and bird and flower and tree actually animal so many stories you know come to the mind one of them is ojas you know who was ojas ojas was the bullock and when some the caretaker was hitting the bullock shurbindo said that the bullock was more receptive than the man <laughs> he was giving message to the man to stop it but man wouldn't receive but bullock received the lord's touch and went through it with a sense of you know ease so he says the bullock was is more receptive than the man tell him then he called for the man they tell him not to do like this and another was uh, bodu the donkey yes yes he would not do any work but jump around in the ashram and when this was reported to shirbindo that he only runs around jumps around but if you give some work he will stand still as if he doesn't uh, he is not capable of doing anything <laughs> shirbindo remarked <laughs> typical sadhak <laughs> so you can imagine typical sadhak i will sit in meditation don't give me work <laughs> so uh, how these animals they responded and even he responded in the race and came first he was not running in the race you know i asked richard da tell me that story because you know it was his donkey so he would stand he would not start every donkey has started the race but he is standing so ultimately they had to invoke the mother and when they invoked the mother suddenly he ran and ran like anything and came first <laughs> so, what a receptivity you know that uh, animals and plants have and the crow that mother crow. used to feed yes and one day every That's, day he would take yes, from yes, mother yes. name yes. was blacky yes. and one day when mother couldn't go champaklal ji went he didn't take he wouldn't take the he food didn't take i want mother to come and give me she's animals had this kind of and of course the tree coming to her that they have decided to yes. cut me the story once i was telling when they were cutting some trees left and right and center i said you know that story ah we know all the stories so that's the end of the story <laughs> <laughs> i But just come and i felt he, very enthusiastic <laughs> so i said you know we are cutting like this we should pray at least something if the contractor wants cut it <laughs> it's a pure practical exigency but uh, look we, how what she has taught us to you know and with a machete no less yeah <laughs> so uh, they answered to her with the simple heart and now comes the explanation in man a dim disturbing somewhat lives it knows but turns away from divine light preferring the dark ignorance of the fall this is the problem of man because he is a he thinks he is too intelligent and he knows everything so he doesn't really need the divine except to fulfill his desires so things like loyalty fidelity mothers you know there is a whole five pictures of i think it is that dog goldie or maybe the dog maybe one of some other one where she writes um, all the qualities that we can learn from the dog faithful loyalty uh, fidelity and things like that you know that we can learn from the dog and they are psychic in their nature among the many who came down drawn to her nowhere she found her partner of high tasks the comrade of her soul her other self who was made with her like god and nature one remarkable yeah. so who are the souls marked out whom she is choosing not those who want to abandon nature or um, you know give all kinds of uh, peeda and pain and suffering to nature and focus only on other worldliness neither those who are completely indulgent in nature completely forgetful of the divinity within so in synthesis there is a very remarkable passage where he says uh, about people who mistake um, 
sacrifice to mean self denial and self immolation he says sacrifice does not mean that he says the krishna within has to be fostered and cherished but what we have to excise are the band of spirits enemies whose names are lust and greed and anger they have to be exercised and not the movement of nature itself <coughs> the movement of nature is very beautiful and it can be beautiful so like god and nature one some near approached where tust caught fire then failed this is one of the letters of shirobindo where he was asked why some people came and they went away does it mean that they were not drawn by anything genuine he says no the initial turning may be genuine but uh, there may be a, a strong ambition especially in asuric natures he uses that example and they may turn away because after some time these things are uncovered and they come up he speaks about dangers and difficulties of yoga the mother speaks about it she says sometimes ambition may get uncovered and can take the better of you and people have gone in you know pursuit of uh, high laurels and degrees in worldly life turned away too great was a demand to pure her force thus lighting earth around her like a sun yet in her inmost sky an orb aloof a distance severed her from those most close pusa apart her soul as the god sleep so you know in the initial years even here mother would hardly come out she used to stay in her room and people would ask they used to see her with some awe and she would be doing like everybody else cleaning the floor sitting on the floor before <coughs> sure window she taught people how to sit before the master <coughs> and once uh, amrita asked shurbindo that you know isn't mira devi a great yogi shurbindo said yes indeed she is very great but she doesn't meet us doesn't give us meditation <laughs> and then shurbindo says that well one day impelled by the divine love she will come out and that indeed will be a great day otherwise she will not coming out and uh, how she used to conceal herself amrita reveals Uh, he wanted requested her that please give me some lessons she said okay we will read together i think the book they read was either yoga and its objects or um, yogic sadhana some one of the books so he describes what a fool i was mother would sit on one chair i would sit next to her and we would read <laughs> as if it's a normal swadhyay going on and that's how she was she is i mean before the lord she would teach us how to you know sit on the floor but for herself she would come down and mix and mingle and that was the reason why she was falling ill and shurbindo says that because she would identify with the consciousness of the sadhaks because that was the only way so she would jump and identify and that's why she fell seriously ill before the formation of the ashram i mean before 1926 and then many things had to change so she started coming out the moment she came out she started taking everybody's burden so um, yes please as yet unlinked with the broad human scene in a small circle of young eager hearts her being's early school and closed domain apprentice in the business of earth life she schooled her heavenly strain to bear its touch content in her little garden of the gods as blooms a flower in an unvisited place as yet unlinked with the broad human scene this now growth of the flame when she is in adolescent nobody knows what is going on later on she describes between the age of 9 and 10 9 to 11 and in the agenda she even speaks about even as early as 7 years when she would experience these gods these beings and she was meeting them in her this was her personal private life but nobody knew as far as schooling she had no interest so one day her brother told her he was reading something and mother asked what are you reading so he said i am reading this 
So he said, tell me about it. He said, why? Why can't you read? So mother took it as a challenge. Because till then she had not started reading. She must be around 8 or 9. Then she picked up. Within 3 days she learnt everything and started reading fluently. So that's why later on when people would go to her and you know tell her, Oh this child doesn't study, doesn't read. And she would tell the teacher or the parents, So oh, why are you bothered about it? Leave the child free. Let the child grow in, the, in its own way. And we have many classic examples like that. Yes. Because more important is the real education which comes from within. See, this classroom education is only a purely mentalized thing. Like mind has built institutions around everything. And thereby it has cut us from the great current of life. Which helps us to grow organically. After all, at the end of the day, what kind of knowledge we really need. Not the abstruse physics, chemistry. <laughs> we need something to live and grow. And we don't get that because the real experience of life, the contact. So uh, children grow up, they have degrees, but they don't know how to handle their own feelings. So, you know, uh, she was being schooled in nature. That's what and how she learned so many things. Later on, she also tells, you know, how she, uh, see how a divine being looks at things. So Satprem once asked her, again, very mentalized way of looking that, you know, hmm. locusts come and they spoil the garden. He talking about human beings who spoil the earth. So what should be done? He says, why are you wanting to do something? No, but you know, they destroy. He says, who told you? You should see how gardens grow in the wild. So he says, what does it mean? Then she gives example of a garden which was hidden to side because of a boundary wall. And one day she opened and went inside. It was uncared for by anyone. And she says that it was so beautiful. It was all in the wild. And I think many of us remember our childhood. I remember, you know, going for getting flowers for puja for my parents. And also quietly stealing mangoes and picking them up. And they were not cared for gardens. They just came up randomly. And those paths made, made something, it was very beautiful. You know, you would have a small little path because of human beings passing through. And it has its own joy and charm. But human beings will put it into fixed shape and fix this. Because this is how the mind operates. But there is a schooling that goes on in nature. If we open the child, he will learn those things. So that's how she was schooled. She schooled her heavenly strain to bear its touch, content in her little garden of the gods, as blooms a flower in an unvisited place. Earth nursed, unconscious still, the inhabiting flame. This earth, of course, is the physical body and uh, the material nature. Yet something deeply stirred and dimly knew. There was a movement and a passionate call. A rainbow dream, a hope of golden change. Some secret wing of expectation beat, a growing sense of something new and rare and beautiful stole across the heart of time. This dream, uh, as a 15 year old, I think she wrote this beautiful story. I think many people have may not have read it, but please read it. A sapphire tale. Read this story? It's in words of long ago. Yeah. It's the story of a girl who is in an island and dreaming of a man who would come. But you know, it may sound at one look about any other story. But it's a story which is beautiful from beginning till end. That is the beauty of the story. And later on she tells children, why do you want to bring in a story, something which must oppose and... We can write a story which is beautiful from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a beautiful story. I myself read it later thinking, eh, story is unimportant. Let's first read all the things. But then all the stories, virtues, the sapphire tale, leader, mm. wonderful stories, you know. Even the leader is based on a real incidence. And I think the children should continue to dream. Yes. All of you should dream. And you can tell your dreams to your family. You can share them, but never stop dreaming. Yes. Even elderly, I tell them that, you know, if nothing is there, dream of the yet future which is to be born. Why not? We shape everything. So why not we 
keep dreaming of beautiful things and imagine beautiful things. Then a faint whisper of her touched the soul, breathe like a hidden need the soul divines. The eye of the great world discovered her and wonder lifted up its bardic voice. Now you see when Shivindu describes how humanity discovered and we know at least some of the stories, some of the names she has said from famous painters, was it Raphael and you know some of those famous ones who uh, appreciated her to the priest in Fao, to Tagore and Abdul Baha. Suddenly you know people what they must have felt. Now we know she is the mother. But they felt something about her and the world discovered her and then comes this wonderful line exalted no, um, a key to a light still kept in being's cave the sunward of an ancient mystery sense her name ran murmuring on the lips of men people must be saying oh do you know have you met her there is something so special about her so her name ran murmuring on the lips of men. Mother would not speak of all these uh, stories, but just a few we know. Beings who were great in their own right. I mean, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha wanted her to take charge of a movement. It's not yes. an ordinary thing. Look at it, the Baha'i sect now. And uh, Tagore wanted her to come and join him in his work. All these... Uh, I mean, two things we know for sure because she has documented that. And many others who would have felt uh, meeting her that there is something so special about her. And this line I love, her name ran murmuring on the lips of men. You see, murmuring. Have you known, do you know her? Have you heard of her? <laughs> it's not through advertisement that Ek so art bar she 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 mati uh, <laughs> You don't need. Sun is sun. That's why when people wanted, you know, she said, I, we don't believe in propaganda. When the sun comes out, it comes out. Sun doesn't have to announce and declare itself, you know, I am Mr. Sun. It is there because it is. By its light, it is known. I think we should read these lines over and over again. Yes. Because when Sri Aurobindo speaks of mother here, he speaks in with such beauty. Yes. And wonder lifted up its bardic voice. Oh. Or as you say, her, ran, her name ran murmuring on the lips of men, exalted and sweet like an inspired verse, struck from the epic lyre of rumor's winds, mm -hmm. or sung like a chanted thought by the poet fame. No, even... This name, he is speaking about mother's name. There is a very interesting conversation where I think it is Nagin Doshi correspondence where he says, I was listening to Mira's bhajans and I felt such a descent of mother's force. How could it be possible? He said, because just the fact of the name Mira, because of the mother's name being there, you know, because he says, no, Mira Kahe. So mm. the fact of mother's name being there can induce this experience. So the power of her name, you know, and how her name is. And she, many people don't know perhaps that uh, they make a lot of fuss about her name being M I W -R, R A. Shurabindo has also spelt it as M I R A. It is there in, a, yes. in his letters, yes. documented. So both names are valid. And he, has, he used to call her Meera Devi. At least two persons used to call her Meera Devi. One is Shurbindra and second was Hardan Bhakshi. <laughs> Bhakshi, I pardon. He was a military man. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Old man is gone. But he was uh, the one who used to announce, you know, at night when people are waiting for mother to come. So it is uh, 11, 11.30. So they are sitting in ashram courtyard. How much can you talk or wait? They fall asleep. So it was Hardhan's job to see when she is coming. When she is coming, he would announce on a bhopu kind of thing. Mother is coming, mother is coming, or Mira Devi is coming, Mira Devi is coming. Now everybody gets up, you know, mother is coming. <laughs> yes, yeah, so many stories uh, about him. One side spoke with my, my guide, Arbinda Basu, and I told him that I was calling Mother 
I would mostly say mother, or sometimes ma, and he said, you can also call her Mira. It was very, very important. Any which way, see the power of the name. But like a sacred symbols was that cult. How beautiful. Admired, unsought, intangible to the grasp. See, that's how we deal with divinity. We admire, but we don't seek to be like that. And we don't understand. And that's the tragedy of, you know, earth nature. Her beauty and flaming strength were seen afar. Like lightning playing with the fallen day, a glory unapproachably divine. No equal heart came close to join her heart. No transient earthly love assailed her calm. No hero passion had the strength to seize. No eyes demanded her replying eyes. Any idea how many disciples were there of Shurabindo till 1950? It was around 200. Can we imagine? We talk about mass movement. It's Shurabindo who doesn't want it. Just about 200. If you look at it, he could have easily commanded the whole earth, you know, with all that. But he didn't want that. That's why he told mother. Like a sacred symbol was that cult. It was so sacred that there was a time when uh, Mother and Shurabindo's photographs had to be put behind under a kind of a curtain. So people who were given the photographs, they were told not to put it publicly in front of everyone. So in their home, supposing there was a disciple but family members were not uh, seekers. So the photograph will be there and the person would put a small little cloth over it. And uh, there are many interesting stories like that because they didn't want till the supramental manifestation. After that we see Shurabindo society and Auroville and the whole thing because the work was done, the fundamental work. But before that they didn't want that, you know, their name should be known and publicized or made popular or, you know, because propaganda then forces come. No eyes demanded her replying eyes. A power within her or the imperfect flesh, the self-protecting genius in our clay, oh. divine the goddess in the woman's shape. So, you know, men who were identified with physical nature, they do felt, something they felt, but you know, there's, there's this hardness in the flesh which protects you even against the divine. And draw back from a touch beyond its kind, the earth nature bound in sense life's narrow make. So though they felt something, human beings who are entrenched in the flesh, yet they couldn't, wouldn't come too near. They would see from afar and admire from afar. I'll complete it. Yes, please. The hearts of men are amorous of clay kin and bear not spirits lone and high who bring fire intimations from the deathless plains, too vast for souls not born to mate with heaven. Whoever is too great must lonely live. Adored, he walks in mighty solitude. Vain is his labor to create his kind. His only comrade is the strength within. Thus was it for a while with Savitri. So. All worshipped marvelingly, none dared to claim. Her mind sat high, pouring its golden beams. Her heart was a crowded temple of delight, a single lamp lit in perfection's house, a bright, pure image in a priestless shrine. Midst those encircling lives, her spirit dwelt, apart in herself, until her hour of fate. So this is very beautiful and uh, significant. The hearts of men are amorous of clay kin. 
so when people approach god they want the standard stock things and that is why people find difficult to understand mother and shri bindu because they are not seeing the standard stock things that get up in the morning touch your parents feet say a prayer or a mantra none of that on the contrary mother laughs she says you know all the habits are breaking oh <laughs> no most people find it very difficult that uh, ascetic things he says you know have no significance from the spiritual point of view in fact he says they are dangerous people she says things like people can you can, you can practice a discipline like the hot yoga and raj yoga but not even enter the spiritual life mm. the former arrives at body control and the sec- later at mind control now when you say such things they are too high and great for human littleness so it's very difficult and you know we are amorous of clay kin somebody who can you know talk and speak like us our language and bear not spirits lone and high who bring fire intimations from the deathless plains to vast for souls not born to meet with heaven whoever is too great must lonely live reverse is not true that whoever is living lonely is too great <laughs> <laughs> besides this loneliness is an inner loneliness you can be lonely in a crowd that's precisely what shirvinder says that one can be in multitudes while being alone because you are in your mind world in all kinds of images whereas you can be lonely in a crowd this loneliness is about that nobody is there who can share with you your life because it is too high too vast too profound otherwise outwardly we see the divine mother she was married shirbindu got married so it's not about the outer life it's about the inner loneliness where there is nothing which can share the rich and profound existence i mean how could shirbindu reveal what he is going through or the mother what she is experiencing and uh, of course uh, her husband with whom she came he had a hint that she is divine mother but this became a problem for him because he she would fight that you make me god because you are divine mother <laughs> so you can do it but she won't because she is not come to follow the normal pattern whoever is too great must lonely live adored he walks in mighty solitude vain is his labor to create his kind his only comrade is the strength within so she wants that people should become you know close to her friendship with the divine at one place she says you know friendship with the divine is a very difficult thing because then he will be very unsparing to you as long as from far devotee seeking some help is okay but friendship with the divine if he gives you he will be thorough like arjuna Shri Krishna gave his friendship to Arjuna, but look what he had to undergo all his life. Thus was it for a while with Savitri. All worship marvelingly, none dared to claim. Here, claim is of course in the sense to come near her, to share, to be close to her. Her mind sat high, pouring its golden beams. Her heart was a crowded temple of delight. a single lamp lit in perfection's house a bright pure image in a priestless shrine meets those encircling lives her spirit dwelt a part in herself until her hour of fate so you see some of these uh, lines have very cryptic sense often in savitri we meet one of them is crowded temple of delight so uh, there is a delight of oneness so, that yogi is experience withdrawing from the world but there is a delight of multiplicity where you carry multitudes you carry the whole creation you carry the world within and you suffuse delight into everything and everything is a uh, equal delight so it's a crowded temple of delight another very cryptic line is a bright pure image in a priestless shrine Hmm. so what is this priest which is missing in the shrine you see the role of the priest is till you come in contact with the deity that is what the priest is meant to do but when the divine has awakened in you fully 
you don't need the priest you are free from the priest in ordinary human beings it is the mind which is the priest which is an ignorant priest man sharir pran neta that's how it is described the true priest is the psychic being agnir hotaram but here it's priestless because you don't need there is a direct contact with the divine when one engaged with her so this no is no intermediary yes no intermediary so you know it's very interesting some of many places in savitri suddenly there will be a cryptic line which goes unnoticed in the flow but when you dwell upon it it's something marvelous like crowded temple of delight i love this line it's not delight of oneness only but delight of multiplicity so i think we will stop here and meet tomorrow start a new canto <laughs>